everyone. Um, welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I'm so happy to have you here today and excited to introduce our guest. I know it'll be a fascinating conversation. On Dr. Jill Live. Okay. I'm so happy to have you here today and excited to introduce our guest. I know it'll be. Okay, sorry about that. They're changing um, how they do the live. And so I have this echo as I go. So everybody bear with me. We're going to get all settled here again. And um, hopefully you can hear me online. Um, put your name and comments in the comment section. I'll be checking in there a little bit where you're from and where you're joining us from. Um, today, I want to introduce a special guest who I haven't known for very long, but we already found out we have something in common. We both come from a farm background. Um, and interestingly, um, I think that frames not only the work ethic and what we do, but the understanding how the environment and the soils and the gut microbiome really frame our, our health and our illness and what we see in the clinical practice. So super excited to learn that about you, Dr. Jerby. Um, Dr. Jerby is a board certified colon and rectal surgeon who now dedicates a large part of his practice to treating gastrointestinal conditions and from a functional medicine approach. And we're both saying we're conventionally trained, but we've really expanded that um, view of root cause and, and everything. Um, and functional medicine is my passion as well. He's particularly interested in expertise in gut uh, microbiome, dysbiosis, small and large intestinal and bacterial overgrowth, constipation, fecal incontinence, and cancer, um, which is all connected. While still performing surgery when necessary, Dr. Jerby has been very successful in treating and preventing surgery, treating and preventing surgery for those with ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, gallbladder disease, and more. Offering anal manometry and biofeedback for incontinence and pelvic floor disorders, as well as abdominal massage for abdominal pelvic adhesions. I am absolutely honored and excited to have you here and to talk to you. Um, I love to start with a little bit about your background. How did you go from the farm into medicine and then into colorectal surgery? Tell us a little bit about your journey, and then we'll go to how'd you find functional medicine? Yeah, well, thanks for so much for having me, and um, I'm super excited to to um, meet you and talk to you. And so, um, to answer your question, uh, I grew up on uh, uh, working on a farm in Kansas, and um, I guess my journey started um, when I had, as a little kid, I had an autoimmune, uh, a transient autoimmune GI disorder which required surgical intervention. And that GI surgery that I had was one of my, you know, uh, impetuses for, um, for going into medicine. And, um, you know, looking back on it, how, uh, you know, uh, I was being set up for, <laughs> for what I do now um, was the fact that I um, did a lot of uh, work on a, a Kansas wheat farm as a boy. And one of my jobs during wheat harvest was to um, drive this big wheat uh, truck uh, full of uh, uh, freshly harvested wheat to where we wanted to take it to a, a, a grain bin and um, store it until the market was right for selling it. And so my job was um, uh, as a kid, I mean, I didn't even have a driver's license yet. I was 12 or 13 years old, but um, you know how that works. In I do, I got right? thrown in the at 12 as well. And I did either like, you just, just drive it over here at the strawberry farm. And I was like, ah, because yeah. they expect it at that age that you know how to drive. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. So it was one of those, yeah, you had to do it. Yeah. So I would back the truck up to this auger and I would um, lift the bed of the truck and start emptying out the wheat. But before I started um, augering the wheat into the grain bin, I turned on this humongous 20 gallon jug of malathion and it sprayed malathion, which is a pesticide all over this wheat because we wanted to keep the insects out of the wheat. Well, this was this was hard red winter wheat, which went directly to a flour mill to be processed into flour to become bread. And um, I can guarantee you that the, the wheat was never washed because it would ruin it. Yeah. Um, and so this malathion that I was spraying on there um, was being also, you know, introduced into people's bread. And so I didn't realize it then, but that was um, one of the things that really got me thinking when I became um, a colon rectal surgeon. I had been 
um, practicing for a number of years, and I was seeing more and more and younger and younger patients with s surgical GI diseases. So um, I was cutting out colons and small bowel and all kinds of things. And I said, what, I mean, isn't there something that's causing this? Yeah. I mean, seeing 30 year old people with colon and rectal cancer, I mean, come on, there's something has to be causing this. And we were seeing the, the rate of colon and rectal cancer, you know, quadruple in people less than 40 years old. And um, so the big question was, what in the world is causing this? And so that started me on my journey to think, wow, it's got to be something in our food. And, and um, that also helped me remember back to, <laughs> to when I was a kid and what I did to the wheat that was um, transformed into flour, which was transformed into people's bread. Yeah. And so that got me started on this functional medicine um, journey and, um, you know, has gotten me in, ended up to where I am now. So I that hope that answers your question. Amazing story. No, because it's so relevant to me too. Grew up on a farm, saw all this stuff. And at 25, I got breast cancer and I have no doubt what well water, atrazine, some of these same things contributed. And I don't know if you know my story and we don't need to talk a lot about it, but just to frame this at 26, right after the chemotherapy, the breast cancer and the treatment, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So no surprise, right? And again, you know how this goes. The doctor said diet has nothing to do with it. He said, you're going to need surgery. You're going to need lifelong immune modulating drugs. This is incurable. Right. Well, guess what? I didn't need any of that. I'm off meds. I've been, I consider myself cured because I have no evidence for 20 years. That's and, fantastic. Right. So I get this so deeply and I'm so passionate and so excited to have someone like you sitting here. I mean, truly, I could almost cry with gratitude to have someone who has that surgical background and understanding, but also knows this bigger world because I'm living like proof of the power of diet, nutrition, the microbiome and fixing that. And as you so all know, my story goes with the, the chemotherapy clearly caused in per, a permeable gut situation. And I have NOD2, which is a high risk gene that causes um, immune reaction to a normal microbiome. And so, of course, you know the story. But what's powerful is that my story and many of your patients, we can heal without surgery and without drugs. And I never right. did take, I think I took a short course of steroids for a, a few weeks. And that's the only immune kind of drug I've ever had in my life. So it's pretty amazing that it's possible. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and, you know, as you, as you already kind of alluded to, you know, it's all about that gut barrier yeah. um, and how it interacts with your microbiome, how it interacts with your immune system. And um, yeah, the gut is, is the root of all kinds of, uh, of diseases and, and that's where it really starts. And, and, you know, that's where it was kind of a, a, a really natural transition for me from going to seeing the the end disease, yeah. which is like terrible um, uh, intestines all riddled with um, inflammation and strictures and, and the whole mass. And um, then, you know, going to the point where I thought that, wow, we can actually prevent this from getting to this um, degree and prevent surgery. And so I still do some surgery, yeah. but I'm really have uh, de devoted my time to preventing the need for surgery. And um, it's really been super satisfying for me. Yeah. What a powerful thing, like I said, with your background, because you've seen the physiology, you've seen the anatomy of what happens. And then what you did that not everybody does is ask the question, well, why? Why? Because for me too, it's like when we start to ask the questions, we went into medicine to help people heal, right? And then we go down these paths and sometimes we forget our beginnings. And um, but the true beginning is like, why does disease happen? What happened here? How can we reverse it? And granted, surgery has its place. It's a lifesaver. But then again, some of these cases. So you mentioned something that I found fascinating. And again, with my um, knowledge of functional medicine, that permeability, we call it intestinal hyperpermeability. It's been called leaky gut in the layman's terms. But for a long time, especially in, in your um, field, it was kind of said, you know, there wasn't a lot of respect for that term or even acknowledgement that it existed. Do you feel like that's shifting a little among your colleagues, like acknowledge, acknowledging that it actually does exist and does contribute to disease? Tell me a little about your journey, because again, that's been a hard sell for conventional medicine. With how it yeah, really yeah, no, uh, I, I, I totally um, am with you there. Uh, it, it, it was one of those terms that was like, yeah, leaky gut. Yeah. Like that right. really, exists. like, right. 
<laughs> but um, interestingly, when I was a resident in the 90s, you know, I did a lot of work in the trauma ICUs and we were seeing these um, uh, people come in with injuries. All they had was a, a severe closed head injury, no abdominal trauma, no other trauma, just a bad knock on the head. And three days later, we they spike a fever. We do blood cultures and their GI bacteria are now in their blood. So we were calling that bacterial translocation. Of course, that's to the nth degree. But what we didn't embrace was the fact that this happens at varying degrees. I mean, obviously, um, when you're in the intensive care unit and whole bacteria shows up in your blood, that's kind of the worst possible scenario. Mm -hmm. But to a lesser degree, that sort of thing is going on in people walking around on the street, but it's more like um, translocation of bacterial pieces and parts, activating the immune system and causing this inflammatory response. Um, And and the whole big picture is what's commonly known as, as leaky gut or what we like to call as increased intestinal permeability because it sounds more medical yeah exactly Uh, but it's the same idea and you know we were seeing it back then but we didn't put two and two together and because we only thought it happened with severely traumatized people but with lesser traumas like some of the stuff we're being exposed to in our environment Mm -hmm. um those things are going on to a lesser degree and it's kind of like a um yes it, the same thing's happening, but it's not putting you in the intensive care unit. It's just slowly, and can I use this term? It's slowly killing you yeah. and not quickly like um, it could happen in the ICU. So in, inflammation starts, and the, as, you, um, as you know, uh, inflammation is the root of all kinds of evil. Yeah. Um, and um, those are the kinds of things that we're seeing as chronic diseases um, in our society today. And, and that's what we're kind of out to, to, to stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned, first of all, love that analogy. And you're right. I've always thought, you know, like same thing as sepsis, not always, but many times in the ICU, someone's severely ill, especially like you said, with head trauma, but even post-surgical, if they're really ill, that sepsis is coming from the gut. It actually literally is. So same as you, I've been like, wait a second, we've known this from residency. We've seen it. It's not new, um, but we just haven't thought about it in the realm. And I think as our world gets more toxic and as the soils change and the microbiome changes, we're getting more and more changes that affect that permeability and then cause dumping and immune activation. And we know now that lipopolysaccharide and that endotoxic effect is a root with obesity, diabetes, heart disease, like it's way further than just the gut. Um, talk a little bit about, say someone like myself would come in in their twenties or thirties with Crohn's and maybe they're stable, maybe they're not. Um, clearly, probably like you, if needed, I use medications to stabilize, but how would you look at them from a functional perspective that might be different from just meds and surgery? Um, would you look at their gut microbiome? What would you do with a patient with um, inflammatory bowel in, in the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question because that's one of the things that I really um, have focused on. Um, we see a, a, a lot of inflammatory bowel disease patients. And, um, you know, what I tell them is that uh, in conventional medicine, um, they have one tool in the toolbox. And of course, if you've got one tool in the toolbox, if there's a problem, what tool are you going to use? Yeah. You're going to use the one tool, which is some sort of anti inflammatory pharmaceutical. Mm-hmm. And um, that's all well and good. Those, those things can be very helpful, but they, they don't address all of the other needs when it comes to inflammatory bowel disease. So when I see an inflammatory bowel disease patient, um, whether or not they're on steroids or a biologic or whatever they might be on, um, I tell them, look, we, we need to cover all these other bases, which includes, hey, let's look at your microbiome. Yeah. Let's make sure you don't have, um, you know, pathogenic bacteria that are, are um, causing uh, part of your problem. Let's make sure that your commensal bacteria are, we're working on getting them back into balance because typically 
um, in inflammatory bowel disease, the immune system attacks the good bacteria and leaves the bad or the pathogenic bacteria to have their way in, in a person's gut. And um, so we, we definitely want to look at the microbiome, uh, you know, and, and there's, there's not a perfect way of doing that just for our listeners, um, but we take what we can get. And that's the best way to do that with the least invasive um, method is do a, a comprehensive stool analysis. And that, that can tell us a lot of things because not only do we want to know about the, um, the, the balance of the good bacteria versus the quote unquote bad bacteria, but we also want to know how well a person is digesting and absorbing. Um, because if, if they're not digesting and absorbing, then they're going to be losing out nutrients, which can make them sicker. They're going to be leaving nutrients in the in the lumen or the space of the gut, which is just more food for the back, the bad bacteria. And so, um, and plus um, undigested uh, food can also cause uh, worsening diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, et cetera. So we look at that. Um, we look at inflammatory markers um, to make sure that we, you know, we know um, what the levels are because we can follow that to see if people's inflammation is getting better. We want to make sure they don't have um, parasites. It's rare, but every once in a while we, yeah. we see one and it can make a difference in some cases. Um, and uh, then we also want to know, uh, let's say you have good gut bacteria. Um, well, one of the jobs of good gut bacteria is to make, uh, is to make things like short chain fatty acids. And short chain fatty acids, of course, are... Um, are super important to the health of the gut lining. So we wanna know what the short chain fatty acid levels are. And, and that's a great thing about some of the functional medicine testing is that there's one test that can tell us just about everything that we wanna know about um, the, what's going on, at least in the colon. And it's not perfect for the small bowel, but it gives us a pretty doggone good idea. And, um, you know, uh, there is no perfect test, so we 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 take the 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 clues, the information, the evidence, and we put it all together, and um, we come up with a more comprehensive approach to inflammatory bowel disease. So, um, and and we try to help people. We come alongside them if they want to stay on their biologic or their steroid. We yeah. obviously we don't want to get them off their steroid because you don't want to be on that long term, but. Sure. Let's say a person wants to stay on their, their biologic. Well, fine. We'll come in, pull alongside, drive parallel with the conventional medicine approach and help that to work better. Um, if they want to try to get off of their biologic, well, we can help facilitate that. If they come in and they haven't been on a biologic yet and they're trying to uh, prevent going on one, we can help them do that. So we, we try to meet them where they are and, um, and cover all the bases that conventional medicine really um, doesn't uh, address, including diet. Like you said, yeah. your your doctor said, "Oh yeah, it doesn't matter what you eat. Um, food food has no difference." Well, wrong. Right, and it's funny now. Like I can pull studies that show Crohn's and diet do. Like for me, back twenty years ago, a specific carbohydrate diet was what I ran into, and for me, it helped. And unbeknownst, you you'll get this. It's funny. I'll just tell you a few of my little things that helped me to heal all that you yeah. just said. And so this is a clinical case, real life. Um, I had hypochlorhydria probably from a very young age, zinc deficiency and um, pretty severe pancreatic insufficiency. So that was all contributing to overgrowth in the small bowel of both fungus, um, Saccharomyces, um, Cerevisiae and um, bacteria. So I had to treat that SIBO and SIFO, the bacteria and fungal load. I had a little dysbiosis, Klebsiella was there. And then I had to add back pancreatic enzyme and uh, hydrochloric acid. And then um, same thing, short chain fatty acids were low. So I took butyrate as a supplement and uh, ate foods with butyrate. But that diet was probably the biggest change because I went from a vegetarian, not knowing any better. I was more of a carbitarian and I had gluten in my diet and I have high risk genes. I was never formally diagnosed with celiac. I may or may not had had it, but either way, the gluten out of my diet made a big difference. So kind of like just what you said, I, I went through all those in my own body. Um, now you mentioned the, the comprehensive stool. I love that. I do that the same way. Um, are you doing much breath testing for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, 
uh, in the context of IBD or, or just in really general? any any patient that comes in with yeah. gut issues and symptoms? Yeah. I know just so common with like IBS actually more, right? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, in IBD um, studies show that maybe one in five people with IBD also have um, yeah. bacterial overgrowth, but um, more often the people that I see, um, mm -hmm. you know, are trying to function. They they they're struggling with bloating every day, uh, bowel moving irregularities. Uh, and so, yeah, just about every one of those um, with that scenario is going to get a breath test. <laughs> yeah. um, and again, breath tests aren't perfect, um, but uh, breath tests are important because not only does it tell you which um, mm -hmm. gas is being overproduced, but it also um, can give you an idea how much treatment a person's going to need. So different gases get different treatments. As you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but just for the listener's sure. sake. Um, but uh, you don't know, otherwise you're just guessing. And I can't tell you how many people come into me that have been treated with Zyfaxin or whatever without, without a breath test. Yeah. And um, then we do a breath test and we find out that it was the exact wrong treatment or an incomplete treatment. Right. And so, um, for you listeners out there, um, and Dr. Jill would agree with me that, um, you know, you really need to do a breath test. So, you, so we get more precise of, of what we're treating. If you have SIBO or intestinal methanogen overgrowth or whatever it is. Um, but yes, that's a long answer to your short question. We do a lot of breath testing. We see a lot of SIBO and we offer a, a more comprehensive approach than standard maybe um, uh, conventional medicine does because not only do we treat the bacterial overgrowth, but we also um, offer kind of a comprehensive approach to try to prevent it from coming back by addressing the root cause and optimizing the microbiome and, and you know, all those things that uh, are necessary um, in, in a comprehensive approach approach. And I'm sure you see a good bit of that in your practice too. I do. Yeah. I still do a lot of gut. Um, so I love what you said, cause it really is that. And what we see same thing, a lot of conventional docs might do a breath test or might not, and just give Zyfaxin. But if you don't address the root cause, which you mentioned the pancreas, the stomach acid, um, the motility is huge. And then, and all of those things have to be addressed. And then, as you mentioned, most breath tests do both hydrogen and methane. There's a newer test that now does hydrogen sulfide, but those are the big three. Um, and super common to have something like the methane and then just like Baxin alone won't treat it. Um, right. Typically use, I use meds as well, but do you use all meds or some herbs or do you do some of both when you're treating SIBO or what's your pre preference? Yeah, I, that's why I tell my patients, I say, you know, the, the, the great thing about what I do, at least in my opinion, is that we have all options available. So um, we use pharmaceuticals. Uh, I love Rifaximin. Mm -hmm. I think it's just this amazing antibiotic because it's not absorbed to a, 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 you yeah. know, a, a significant degree. It only works in the gut. And the studies show that it actually supports the commensal bacteria yeah. while it knocks down the overgrowth, which is just outstanding. Yeah, we didn't um, have that years ago. Like when I went to medical school, that wasn't it. So it is a very, and I agree with you. I want to say this because a lot of people are afraid of antibiotics. I feel very different about rifaximin and I use it just like you frequently because I feel like we get a great result without a lot of harm to the microbiome. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so we, we have all the pharmaceutical, um, you know, uh, availability as well as herbal. So I use a lot of herbals and then um, we'll do elemental diet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, yeah. it's not, you know, people aren't crazy about it, even though um, some, some others have said, Hey, be more positive about the elemental diet. But I just think about myself trying to do an elemental diet. I would only do it if something else hadn't worked. And so that's what I do for my patients is if I only kind of bring that in as, a, as an option, if let's say my herbal protocol or my, um, my pharmaceutical pro protocol hasn't been as effective as I wanted, but also do a hybrid kind of as you were implicating um, or implying yeah. um, that you can also use a, a pharmaceutical plus an herbal. And yeah. so that's what's yeah. so great about what we do is that we've got all the options. Um, conventional pretty much just does pharmaceutical. 
naturopaths, um, well, not all of them, but a lot of them just do herbals, yep. um, you know, nutritional um, practices, just do elemental, but we do all. So um, I think I, I couldn't agree more. And I love that because often I'll do it. And usually the antibiotic is no more than two weeks. So although you did mention allude to you probably like me, if the hydrogen's really high, I sometimes go 30 days. I, I have kind of a cutoff. Um, I'd love to get your opinion. I think around 20 or 30 um, units of hydrogen, whatever that unit is, is a good, it does, if it's say it's 60, would you go longer than two weeks? Yeah, I'm not opposed to going um, three weeks with rifaximin mm -hmm. if the hydrogen's um, super high. Um, studies suggest that you can drop it by 30 to 40 points with a two week course. But I, I go a lot on how, how the patient's feeling. Um, so if they hit like 80 or 90 percent improvement in symptoms, then um, I, I move on. But if they haven't hit that, I either repeat the breath test or go a little bit longer with the treatment or even sometimes change it up to mm -hmm. from a pharmaceutical to an herbal because I kind of yeah. say, you know what, um, the pharmaceutical is like a right jab and the herbal is like a left hook. So we're hitting it from both directions. And if we hit it from all directions, then we'll knock it out. Love it. And I couldn't agree more. And often, like you said, or sometimes I'll do the um, antibiotic rifaximin plus right after then I'll start an eight week herbal course or something like that. And like yeah. you said, I kind of check in with the patient. What do you prefer? How do we do this? Are you improving? And what's yeah. really great fungus and yeast is hard to detect. Um, and that can be coexistent. And if that's there, the herbals tend to by far do a better job because often those herbs, berberine and caprylic acid, oregano, et cetera, they cover both. Um, and I'm sure you found that as well. If they're Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, you know, like you say, there's a significant percentage of folks that have those coexisting, both SIBO and CFO, which for the listeners is small intestinal fungal overgrowth. And that, that can be a bad combination. It can be really tough and it's really hard to nail down CFO. You almost have to go on, um, you know, just uh, a, a clinical feeling. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, but it, it, it can get both of them. And, and so I do like to come back with a, an herbal protocol just in case yeah. we've got a little bit more bacterial work to do, but still haven't addressed fungus. Mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned that because that's what I've, I've been talking about for years. Like, I think the suspicion of fungus has to be high because again, in medical school, we're not, we're almost taught that it doesn't exist except we know better. And yeah. even if it's not systemic, um, you know, sepsis from fungus, it can be there and be very significant in the patient's lives. But like you said, um, whether it's the antibodies in the blood or the stool test or organic acids, you can do a lot of tests and still not find it. But if there's a massive I, symptoms I've seen as the yeast, the craving for sugar, brain fog. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeast produce a product called acetaldehyde. It's the same thing from alcohol after a hangover. So it's almost like right. they're hungover. And I love that you said that though, because it's, it is hard to detect. And that's why conventionally we're not taught because it's hard to find. But if you're looking for it, you and I see it all the time. And it is relevant because they don't get better if you just treat the one side and they have both. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, the, in this day of, of not, doing physical exams. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I still think physical exam is important because I can't tell you how many times that, um, you know, just the physical exam itself yeah. greatly raised the suspicion of um, having coexisting CFO or even SIBO um, yeah. by itself. And I see some kids and I, there's a, a number of times in the recent past where I'm talking to the mom and, and I'm not thinking, you know, a bacterial overgrowth. And then I examine the child and, you know, tap around on their tummy and there's a good bit of gas in there. And there's some distension that you wouldn't otherwise detect. And lo and behold, um, we do a, a breath test on this, you know, eight or nine year old and, and sure enough, they've got a bacterial overgrowth. So physical exam is, is an important part. Um, I, you know, I, I, I try to um, do at least one exam on people and, and encourage them to drive to see me yeah. if they're coming from long distances. Sometimes that not that's not possible, but but then I I say, look, go to your go to your primary care physician and have them lay hands on your belly. Yeah. Uh, uh, so those 
you know, it, it's a, you, you collect, I tell people I'm kind of like a, a medical detective. I'm trying to, I'm going to a crime scene, which is, is the yeah. medical condition. And I'm trying to gather clues from all these different areas. And then I put all the clues together and kind of come up with a um, whodunit sort yeah. of um, thing. And, and sometimes fungus is the whodunit. Um, sometimes it's not, but you got to have yeah. a high index of suspicion. Yeah. I love that you said that because again, it's really uh, conventionally we aren't taught to look very far for that, um, and just very very specific. Um, I find white coating on the tongue. So if you're listening, look in the mirror. You have a real white white coating on the tongue. Could be fungus. Um, if you're hypothyroid and untreated, that can contribute to SIBO or fungal overgrowth because just that slight bit of decrease of temperature in your body will allow for the proliferation of yeast and fungus, and also the motility is lacking, and you need good motility in the small bowel to prevent this from happening. I always joke about it like hockey, the Zamboni that goes between the periods on the ice. That's kind of like the migrating motor complex in the gut. And if that's not working, you're going to have this uh, stagnation and overgrowth of bacteria or yeast in the gut, which is why you mentioned all these other things that we think about. Um, we talked a little bit about Crohn's and your approach, which again, look at the microbiome. Is there anything different with ulcerative colitis? Because they're very similar. They're in the same IBD, but they do present a little differently. Is there anything different you would do with the ulcerative colitis patient versus the Crohn's? Yeah, and also Gladys, I'm always looking for hydrogen sulfide mm -hmm. um, because it's a big player in wow. ulcerative colitis. And that's where um, I think, again, the comprehensive stool analysis comes in because this is the, the, the stool analysis is going to tell you about the microbiome mainly of the, of the colon, let's face mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, but I can't tell you how many times that um, I look at uh, the microbiome of the person who I either suspect has ulcerative colitis or it's been definitively diagnosed and they have an overgrowth of a particular species. It's a sulfate reducing bacteria called desulfovibrio piger. And you know that one on the, mm -hmm. on the um, stool analysis. And that one um, uh, really makes hydrogen sulfide and, and the hydrogen sulfide, if, it, if the concentration is high enough, it, is pro-inflammatory. It, it creates inflammation. And just with controlling that particular organism when it's overgrown can make a huge difference in, um, in you know, how, how uh, the clinical setting of how mm -hmm. people are doing and their symptoms. So I definitely always look for that. Don't see it so much in Crohn's, yeah. um, but with ulcerative colitis, that's a, a big difference. And um, of course, with both Crohn's and UC, yeah. um, we're, we're instituting, you know, uh, dietary precautions and sometimes even putting them, if they have a flare, sometimes even an elemental diet for two or three weeks, if they're willing to do that, yeah. can make a huge difference as well in cooling down that flare. And that's been corroborated by a number of clinical studies mainly come out of Europe. Um, so not yeah, so much done. Right. And, and the, like you said, the evidence is actually really good for elemental diets. It's just that it's inconvenient to patients. They don't always like it. Um, so it's not that they don't, that they're lacking evidence on that. I love that you mentioned that because it is a great option. And for those of you listening, there's commercial formulas out there, but there's also um, a couple of like um, uh, pharmaceutical um, nutritional companies that make them. And there is on the web uh, a naturopath, um, C. Becker, who has created a homemade elemental diet. So that's a place to look. I think it's uh, seboinfo.com or .org. Um, yeah, I think that's hers, right? You know, Allison probably too. Um, right. Now I've been on a few boards, like listening to some of the people who know a lot more than me on the hydrogen treatments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and I can share some of the things I've heard um, as far as, because I feel like it's a harder thing to treat than the methane or the hydrogen. Um, any successes on um, the kind of meds or herbs that you use for hydrogen sulfide? Yeah, you're right. It's a toughie. Um, and let's face it, we don't have a whole lot of clinical data. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's kind of it's kind of one of those things that we've known it's been around, but we haven't studied it as much as probably need be. And, um, you know, there is a hydrogen sulfide study group mm -hmm. that is collecting data. Um, and uh, the data shows that the clinical scenario is all over the place. Um, it's not just diarrhea. Yeah. Um, but 
for the ones that I've done, like a Trio Smart, which you yeah. know uh, tests all three of the gases that you mentioned, um, and I have a definitive um, elevation of uh, of hydrogen sulfide. The things that I've found um, effective are um, I have treated it with rifaximin, mm -hmm. but I add um, I add bismuth, which yeah. Pepto bismol, mm -hmm. um, essentially, or you can get a compounded version mm -hmm. of um, bismuth as well, which is probably more effective. But anyway, uh, it's expensive and Pepto bismol is a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, but the combination of those two, have, I've had success with. Um, on the herbal side, I've had success with um, kind of high dose oregano, yeah. where you really hit it with high doses. Um, some people don't tolerate that very well, so you got to be careful, but um, I have had some uh, uh, success, clinical success with that as well. So, um, and there are other, um, you know, treatments out there. You could use the elemental diet. I haven't done that yet because yeah. in my practice, um, hydrogen sulfide is a, is a fraction mm -hmm. of, yeah. um, of hydrogen SIBO and, and intestinal methanogen overgrowth. Um, so I don't see it that much, but when I do see it, those are the things that have worked. So, um, rifaximin and, and Pepto-Bismol or bismuth and high dose oregano, which you're talking, you know, um, I use, uh, ADP, which is yep. an emulsified tablet. And so you're talking, you know, five tablets, which is 250 milligrams, three times a day, which is a ton. Yeah. I mean, you, you probably smell like a uh, pizza shop, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I love that you say that because that's exactly my experience. And there are some studies out there with blastocystis, which is a protozoa that probably the most common, if we do see parasites, that's the one that we do. And it's, it's that exact brand that was studied and it was three to four, three times a day. And that was back 10 years ago. I used to think that was so high, but same as you, that stuff is really effective if you go high enough. And because it's enteric coated, people not always tolerate it, but better than at least like the oil, if you were doing drops, that would be impossible. Right. <laughs> you would definitely smell like pizza. Um, I've heard a little bit about Uva Ursi and silver. I don't use a lot of silver in clinical practice, so who knows, but the, and the Uva Ursi, I sometimes will just add to the regimen. I don't feel like alone it's enough, but love that you're saying that is bismuth is really a key too, I think. Um, and interesting if sometimes we'll see on the stool, someone who has H. pylori, then hydrogen SIBO and bismuth tends to be real good to prevent bacterial from H. H. pylori from adhering to the stomach. So that's a nice thing if you have two things to, to be able to use that for both um, combination. Um, right. This is fantastic. So you also talked about um, motility disorders like constipation. Um, what's some other pearls? Because that's a big deal. And I'm sure that you treat a lot of methane SIBO that's constipation and that's a root cause. But say you've treated methane SIBO or you, uh, you know, having trouble getting that level down. What other tips or tricks or things do you do for the chronic constipation? So you're saying um, you, you, they either don't have methane SIBO or you they had it and you've treated it it's gone but they still have constipation yeah and maybe you yeah. can go just because our listeners maybe don't know this but methane SIBO clearly is related to constipation so let's start there what would you do to treat the methane SIBO and then if it doesn't resolve what would you do for constipation yeah see uh see methane all the time and um you know one of the things that methane does is causes constipation but it also, in my experience, um, causes a lot of neurologic symptoms. Um, people are just miserable. Yeah. Um, they have a fair amount of pain, usually on the right side. Not that's not you know hard and fast rule, but that's my experience. Um, and a lot of them also have coexisting fungal overgrowth because there's some evidence that the fungus and the methane producing organisms kind of uh, have a symbiotic relationship. And um, so uh, whenever I've, uh, well, to go back to your question, um, again, um, the methane producing organisms are not technically bacteria. They're, they're, they're more primitive organisms and antibiotics and I'm not telling Dr. Jill anything that she doesn't already know. I'm telling this for you, the listeners out there, but antibiotics are designed for bacteria. But if we've got a more primitive organism, antibiotics will work, 
but you've just got to pound it hard or you just, you know, for a hydrogen producing organism, you might just have to flick it. Yeah. But with a methane producing organism, you got to take a sledgehammer and beat it to death um, to get rid of it. So that's why we use um, generally use two agents instead of just one. And, um, and so we're Faximin plus neomycin. Uh, those are two pharmaceutical antibiotics or on the herbal side, I'll use, a, like you've already mentioned, I'll use a, a fair amount of berberine or oregano because I can use those in high doses mm -hmm. um, and add allicin to that, which is oh, a, yeah. uh, an extract out of garlic. And people that have SIBO are like, garlic, you're going to treat me with garlic? And I tell them, look, it, it's, a, it's the antibiotic extract out of garlic. It has none of the carbohydrates that um, cause, you know, uh, gut disruption with with in the presence of SIBO. So it's not going to have the same um, effects and it doesn't make you smell like garlic or anything like that if the if the extract is pure. And the one that I use is pure, but it's expensive, mm -hmm. uh, but it works. And um, it'd be better to use something that works and pay a little extra more than get something that doesn't work. And, and um, you know, then you're in the same place. But anyway, um, then I'll also use um, combo, you know, um, kind of hybrids. So I'll use, I just prescribed today um, for a 19 year old um, uh, young person, um, a combination of Rifaximin and Allison um, uh, because I didn't think that they would do well with neomycin. Yeah. Neomycin can be a little hard to tolerate for some people, um, but those are my go-tos um, and there's other regimens, but um, you know, when you found something that works, you want to stick with it and only switch if it's not working. And I'm sure that's your experience too. Yeah, I love that. And I couldn't agree more. Everything you said, it totally it would do the same as, um, and then that constipation, you know, whether you, you, you've treated the methane SIBO or you've looked at other things, what else do you do for chronic constipation? Sure. Yeah, um, when I'm looking at, chronic constipation, it, you know, it might, there's, there's kind of three things to think about. Um, number one, uh, the colon doesn't propel the waste material along the, its path. And so we, you know, we call that, um, you know, dysmotility, slow transit constipation, or, or even, uh, you know, colonic atony. <laughs> um, so no motility, um, is one thing. And then let's say the motility is fine, but everything gets kind of, um, jammed up at the outlet. Mm -hmm. Um, that's called, uh, you know, uh, pelvic out, pelvic floor disorder or, or outlet obstruction. Mm -hmm. So the colon might be working fine, but once it gets over to the rectum, um, the muscles of the pelvic floor don't work right and you can't empty. Yeah. So that's a, another kind of constipation that needs to be addressed. And then the worst is a combination of both of those, which would be um, bad motility. The colon doesn't propel things through, but when it finally does get it down there, you can't empty it very well. And that's a bad combination. So let's just say we've done a test and we found out that the mo colon motility is, is um, not uh, where it should be. Well, that opens a whole can of worms because that could be uh, a, a number of different root causes, not the least of which is autonomic disorder, um, vagus nerve dysfunction, um, you know, uh, even a intrinsic um, dysfunction of the colonic cells not um, contracting properly. So uh, it's hard to distinguish between all those. So I will, um, if I'm suspicious of that, then I will kind of come at it from all angles. I'll, I'll do some, um, you know, vagal, uh, vagus nerve stimulation. I'll, um, try to promote motility, which we can promote with either pharmaceuticals uh -huh. or herbals. Um, and some pharmaceuticals work great for some people. And um, some they don't, and some herbals work great for people, and some they don't. So you just gotta kind of find which one works. Um, I like um, 
I like ginger based, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, prokinetics, but some people can't tolerate those from an herbal standpoint. I also like prucalipride, yeah. um, which is a pharmaceutical um, that's fortunately available once again in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, over the mm -hmm. past couple of years, use a lot. Um, so I'll use that, uh, you know, and I'll use um, abdominal massage. Um, you know, uh, I don't use a whole lot of, um, say, like Amatiza uh, or um, True Lance or some of those agents because I've found that they either give people diarrhea, which is just going from out of the frying pan into the fire sort of thing. Yeah or they work for a little while and then they totally lose their effectiveness and you've got to just keep going through all these different medications and then you're out of, uh, you know, you're out of options. So I don't really usually use those too much. They can be okay in the short term, but um, so uh, those are kind of the different approaches. But then let's say a person has pelvic floor disorder, then, um, uh, we'll do anal, anal rectal manometry to prove that, mm -hmm. that their, their muscles are not relaxing when they're supposed to relax and they're, they're, um, they're uh, relaxing when they're not supposed to relax. So they're totally backwards or paradoxical. Um, and that, those people will greatly benefit from biofeedback, which we do in our office. Mm -hmm. And we, we do some retraining of the pelvic floor muscles, which Studies have shown again um, that that's a that's a big um, uh, a big winner for for um, outlet obstruction constipation. Um, and then when you got a combination of the two, then uh, it makes it more complicated. But you do both. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> that's super helpful because again, this is I think becoming more of more of an issue as we're less mobile or we have more toxic load or more dysbiosis. The people who have, and again, from a toxicity perspective, if you're retaining stool, you're just reabsorbing massive amounts of toxins. Um, I want to let you go and, and honor your time. But one last thing I want to talk about, and we can make it brief, gallbladder disease. This is opening a whole can of worms, but obviously super common to have issues with the gallbladder and infection, inflammation, and all that. You did mention that sometimes you can prevent um, surgery. I'm assuming if it's not you know totally inflamed and infected, there's just some dysfunction. What's some little tips about what do you think about with gallbladder issues and where do you go with that? Um, uh, and again, I may be opening a can of worms, but I'd love to just touch on it briefly. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm going to give you my suspicion. I would love to do a study sometime and prove it. Yeah. But I think that many gallbladders could be saved if we would control methane producing organisms in the gut. Because not only does methane slow down the gut, but it also slows down gallbladder uh -huh. emptying. And um, for all the people that have their gallbladders out because they, they had um, gallbladder dyskinesis, which means that the gallbladder doesn't squeeze efficiently and uh -huh. empty the, the bile out of the gallbladder, those people probably had methane. And so if, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, they're they're wanting me to get my gallbladder out because it's not contracting right. I said, before you do that, let's make sure we know your methane status. So um, that is my first go-to if we're trying to save somebody's gallbladder. And um, so, yeah, um, there's makes, other things to do. But yeah, that's just that makes so question. much sense. <laughs> and, and just for the listeners, um, the bile that's produced, well, not produced, but stored in the gallbladder and excreted is a sterilization way to help the small bowel stay healthy. So part of this is actually contributing to the overgrowth of bacteria. If your gallbladder is not working, it's, and from my perspective with mold and toxins, it's also storage for cholesterol and toxins. And so a lot happens in the gallbladder that we don't acknowledge. It's such a huge right. piece of the puzzle. Um, wow, this has been absolutely great wealth of knowledge. I know people are commenting and already saying they appreciate this. Um, where can people find you? And are you taking new patients? Tell us a little bit about where to find you. Yeah, um, we're taking new patients and you, you can find me at Dr. Jerby, that's D-R-J-E-R-B-Y.com. Perfect. And, um, you know, if folks are interested, they can set up a, a phone consultation to see if 
if they feel like our practice is a good fit for them. And I, I find that to be very helpful. Um, but yeah, feel free to check that out. And, and if you want a phone consultation, you can set that up too. Fantastic. Um, we, I am, like I said, I'm truly honored because I always feel like someone with your expertise and then you've expanded this toolbox, you're a rarity and you're a gift because it's so important to get at the root cause. And yet, you know, a lot of docs going straight to surgery. There's nothing wrong with surgery, but I love, love, love that you've expanded your toolbox and that you've shared your wisdom with us today. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. You're